proper thing, David, to this, and this is something that we should not forget. And in terms of investment, or this is the theme of our workshop, is, of, is investment. One of the other areas that we're seeing where there is increased uh, investment opportunities is in uh, Wi-Fi, WiMAX uh, investment. Um, and we're seeing it in the emerging world, in the, in the developing world. Why? Because it offers a, uh, an efficient, in many cases, cost-effective way uh, to provide a, a range of services, including internet access, to overcome what have been traditional uh, barriers to, for those services because of the difficulties of the wireline uh, provision uh, or the cost of building towers uh, for mobile. But uh, that the WiMAX or the Wi-Fi typically, then WiMAX, uh, we've seen considerable amount of investment and that is related also to IP-based services and to increased access to the internet. And there are a number of examples of this. Let me give you one example which I think is quite uh, remarkable. Um, uh, we have an entrepreneur in the satellite industry by the name of Craig McCaw. Uh, Craig McCaw, which uh, is uh, uh, among his other properties, includes ICO. He has a foundation. And the foundation has just given uh, $4 million to the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, for specific purposes of establishing Wi-Fi connectivity in the developing world uh, because of the belief that this will be one of the principal ways by which to increase access to IP services, read that, the Internet. So these are the trends that we see sitting where we sit um, and that seems to be global trends. Thank you, David. Graham, would you like to add anything to that? I'd like to, to backtrack a little bit. Yes. That's all. I'd like to backtrack a little bit and, and, uh, and just emphasize something that several of the speakers have said before, that I think in, in countries such as India, the obvious um, opportunities for I new investment or things that could can help drive new investment is thinking about some of the services which can be provided such as you know healthcare services education services we had a very interesting presentation in the group that I chaired earlier today which um, I uh, Ilka was also on the uh, the, um, the the panel from um, the Mr. Shavla who's head of the he's the lands commissioner in Connecticut state and he has put all of the um, land records online and he's driven down prices and I know there are other, other examples in um, India as well but it's a very very interesting um, way of actually trying to make, make government more efficient at the same time you, you're using um, a lot of capacity he said he had a billion you know records they had to, had to computerize digitize he's got all sorts of issues coming up but that is one very interesting application of you know why you invest you invest not for investment's sake but you think about investing this is in general you invest to actually pr provide services and obviously um, it is a little bit like you know the the, the field of dreams um, you 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 invest you build it and they will come because I think you should also think of it the other way around um, are they coming what are they coming to do can you actually think of shaping the sorts of services you're, pr you're providing or potentially can provide and that will help also drive investment so I think we have to also think of that that demand side always and not lose sight of it because we're not just investing just for investment's sake we're doing something uh, as Art said, um, thinking of um, an investment or an ICT ecosystem where all the parts have to fit together. And I think you know, India has a great opportunity to try and fit those parts together. Thank you, Graham. There were a couple of points that were made during the discussion which we've just had, which uh, I think are worth recalling. Uh, Art talked about what Cisco calls country transformation over broadband. Um, Jake talked about societal benefits and not just service provider benefits, you know, going far beyond in terms of what it can do for society and so on. Um, we also talked about applications over broadband which could make a difference. And then Rajesh talked about the fact ICTs in India still seem to be uh, relegated to mobile connections rather than overall broadband. 
the success of the telecom sector is very well known. It's acknowledged. But the reality is, while we are doing, say, 10 million connections a month in terms of mobile, after 10 years, we have only 10 million broadband connections. Now, while I, I understand that connections over mobile can have various applications which can make a big difference, uh, but when you look at things like uh, telemedicine and long distance learning and so on and so forth, it's difficult to envisage those really taking off over mobile. You need broadband connections, you need interface on a larger screen. Uh, wh why do you think that we have just 10 million uh, internet connections after 10 years? David, as I told that uh, simple browsing is not going to excite to the Indian customer at all. Till the time we are not coming out with the application. Like one of our Indian mobile company has started the education on mobile. And all of the sudden that example picked up. And everybody started saying, kya idea hai Sarji? The same way if add, we add the video along with the audio, which is the requirement of the next generation network. Take the example of the rural. We know that we have a shortage of teachers. The good teachers are available only into the metro or the city. But still a lot of villages are interested in taking the good education from those teachers. If through broadband connectivity, we are providing the video interactive multicasting to those villages, the broadband required a lot. The same is with the health. Latestly in India, few companies <coughs> are coming up very fast in providing the video application on a broadband connectivity. And if once it started picking up, but at the same time, the government has to come forward in giving them the infrastructure. Right now, we have got 40 million copper wire buried in the, into the ground. And out of that, only 2.3 or 3 million maximum is being used for the broadband while rest of the copper wire are unusable. Why the Indian, who, what is the reason the Indian government is not opening that sector, the unbundling of the local loop, so that immediately, whatsoever the target the government is forecasting that can be achievable very shortly. The same way for the rural, not our government, the surrounding governments are talking of the USO fund for the broadband, but not coming forward. For them, the USO fund is meant only for the incumbent, not for others, not for the private players. Even for the mobile, again, the mobile, they are allowing the sharing of the infrastructure, especially the passive and active between the telcos only. But for the broadband, they are not thinking of that infrastructure sharing till date. Because as soon as they will recommend the infrastructure sharing for the broadband, immediately the incumbent, incumbent has to open their local loop. And the, if we are thinking that the broadband application will be available on mobile, so we are dreaming, reason being, when 2,200 crores we are going to pay for the Pan India spectrum as a reserve price, then I think the rural guy will just dream 3G in the night only, will not talk of 3G. And this 3G will be available only to the urban and that to a very upper class only because the cost, this 2,200 crores, the telco who is going to invest for this spectrum is not going to donate, is not interested in donating this money 
they want to earn 22,000 crore out of this 2,200 crores. So what I'm thinking is that the video, not voice, video, is the application on broadband for penetration of the broadband. And like the government has to come forward with the wholeheartedly by giving the infrastructure for the service provider, not only for the incumbent, for the service provider. And then they will find that this 4% of the total population, broadband penetration 4%, how this 4% is translating to into the 20% of the total population. And immediately when we will touch the double digit of the penetration of the broadband, you will find that the whole India is started shaking. Thank you, Rajesh. I think uh, you made some good points there. Uh, I'd also like to touch on what uh, Dick Beard had talked about a little while earlier about the transformation that WiMAX can uh, bring about in terms of broadband penetration. But here again, I don't think that that is going to be the solution in India because of the cost of the spectrum for WiMAX. Um, large telcos can afford it, but there is currently no business case for WiMAX for data connectivity, for internet. So we seem to be faced with an intractable solution. If we recall the discussion we had on access in the main session yesterday, and we looked at internet as a public good. And if independent policymakers could look at it from that point of view, Sean from Africa made a very good point. To enable it, um, policy, policy makers would have to look at telephony and internet very differently and have differing levels of policy, differing levels of licensing, or differing, differing levels of cost of spectrum to enable them. Possibly that is the way forward. But there is a larger co concern, and this is a question I'd like to address to all of you. Given that there's a huge imbalance between the growth of traditional voice services versus the growth of services using internet protocol in India, what are the implications of this going forwards when the world is moving towards unified communications on internet pro protocol? You know, that is the way forward. And we are still stuck on traditional voice platforms because we do not have the large enough capabilities going forward to roll out internet protocol based services because of the very low broadband penetration. Jake? Th thank you, David. Uh, I, I see you like to ask the uh, easy questions last. <laughs> Uh, but, but in all seriousness, I, I think the question almost answers itself in terms of, you know, in order to move forward with the world, you know, broadband is a prerequisite and is a key ingredient. Without broadband, none of these services that we're talking about will exist. Uh, it's, it's almost as simple as that. And, and I think Dick hit on a, uh, on a major point in that, you know, there's no single technological solution. Uh, you know, WiMAX, Wi-Fi, uh, fixed line, uh, maybe in some countries a cable modem service. Uh, the, the key is getting the ingredients or the structural issues solved, removing barriers to entry, and allowing for competition. Uh, there, there's some very you know initial things that can be done. Is what's the um, what's the price for a license? Uh, in the U.S., the price for a license is relatively low very low in fact and what the United States did was they took the spectrum and they auctioned it off uh, they did and they structured the auction in a way that there was a national license there were regional license and there were even smaller licenses so that when a company purchased those license they put capital at risk they had to buy the license and then turn around and earn a return so they could pay essentially what they purchased so there are a number of solutions to look at and at the end of the day, there's still going to be the question, and I think it was really highlighted for me personally yesterday, is the issue connecting the next billion, or is the issue how do we connect the last billion? And the answer to those two questions, I think, are fundamentally different. If we're talking about the last billion, uh, then there may be a, more, a higher degree of need for government intervention, uh, government uh, subsidies, uh, allowing for, 
for companies to bid on serving uh, services, what we on the United States call a reverse auction. Uh, putting it out for competitive bid, technology neutrality, allowing these type of issues to be implemented. But, but David, I, I think your question answers itself is, you know, we all have to move there. Uh, David, I certainly would agree with, with the comments that Jake made, but maybe bring up a, another a, a angle to look at in this issue. Uh, one of the topics, and I see Art Levin from the ITU in the back of the room that reminds me of this, is, is the issue of the ICT and climate change. If you, t if you look going forward, and I, we've all heard discussions about the, uh, uh, the issues of, of, of global warming, and the, uh, uh, the, we all know that ICT has the potential to mitigate many other uses of more energy-consuming technologies. And, and if you look at a, a country like India, where we find, and we listen to Graham talk about the services aspect, the services business, I, I, you know, I happen to be a consulting engineer who works from hotels or wherever I happen to be around the world. You know, a large number of Cisco uh, employees are what we call telecommuters. I, I telecommute 10,000 miles. I, I live 3,000 miles from where my office is. Uh, and so broadband is one of the fundamental capabilities that's necessary to take advantage of the fact that you could work from your home or anywhere else and not have to drive to the office or not have to fly somewhere else around the world in order to get things done. And so as we move forward and people look more and more intently at this issue, we're going to see that climate change issues are going to change behavioral issues. We talk about cities and the, the fact that people are moving to cities and, and energy management issues will become more and more important. And, you know, and, and the systems that will manage that across maybe uh, whole cities will be tied together using broadband technologies as well. I mean, there may be relatively low bit rate, but you have to manage the whole process. Traffic management, automobiles, uh, we're involved in projects in, in, a, in a dozen cities around the world where we're working and utilizing uh, our modeling of traffic from a, a, uh, an internet standpoint and applying it to automobile vehicular traffic to and then come up with patterns that you can, in fact, uh, you know, uh, modulate the the flows of traffic to, to have more efficient so people are not burning as much gas as you go across. So there are lots of uses for ICT in, uh, in, in, in the area of, glo of uh, climate change. But if you look at just that one aspect of telecommuting and having the broadband capability where your citizens have access to it, uh, it has the potential to have a, a significant impact in terms of reducing the amount of greenhouse gases and energy consumption, which uh, obviously every country will be looking at individually. I, just looking for a different angle on that issue. That was, in fact, a very interesting angle because we are talking about moving towards unified communications, which opens up the possibilities a lot more. And really, by not doing enough for broadband in India, are we restricting our ability to move towards unified communications. Graham, is there anything you'd like to add? I've just, just been looking at some statistics which you put together for, uh, in part for this, this meeting. It's interesting to see that you know, China, the number of broadband subscribers per 100 um, population is about 15 times as high as in India, which is interesting. Uh, India is still twice as high as in Indonesia. You know, we're starting to look at big countries. Um, but, and, but Russia is also ahead of India. But you think, you know, when you think of all those IT, uh, ICT or IT service companies, you'd, I mean, I would just guess if it looking at it from outside, you'd have a much higher penetration rate of, of broadband simply because of lots of employees, lots of people, lots of everything. Now, um, why is this? I'm, I'm sure there must be lots of people who have studied this, but if it's a PC problem, then there's ways of subsidizing PCs. So you can then subsidize both PCs or cross-subsidize, and it doesn't have to be the government who's doing it, it can be done by um, the service providers, cross-subsidize between PCs and, and or cheap um, computers, computers of some sort, and cross-subsidize from your service um, payments to buying a cheap PC. I mean, Telmex can do it, other countries can do it. You know, th um, there's been lots of efforts to do this. You might distort markets a little bit, but if that is really the issue, then there are ways around, it, around this. It just needs to have some lateral thinking on the part of both um, providers, service providers, and the government, I think. And long-term benefit for everybody. Right. OK, we are pretty close to the end of our time, which is actually 4 o'clock. Um, 
is there anybody who would like to make a comment? Because we have time for very few comments. Then I'll hand over to Dick for closing remarks uh, as the chair. Sandeep. Few comments. Uh, few comments to the panelists, uh, including Dick, Rajesh, Jake, and Graham and Art. In fact, in terms of the investment opportunities for India in the times to come in are tremendous. Looking upon the fact that you know the 3G auction is going to happen, the YMX auction is going to happen, the AVNO is going to be a reality, and the mobile number portability. So all these four areas in telecom will give a tremendous boost for the investments to come in. And definitely that will uh, require so many other uh, ecosystem to get developed. That is one. Commenting on the, in terms of uh, the internet growth, what has been there in the past and what is there for the future, especially internet and broadband, I feel, I agree with Rajesh, yes, involving of the common man is the most essential part of it. There are things happening now at, at, at various levels where application softwares are available to involve the common man to be a part of the internet game. My basic motto is, until unless you involve the common man to do the, the stuff, he is not just going to be there for browsing it. He has 10 other priorities in this country. There are mostly the rural guys, 70% is all agriculture over here. So you need to have applications which are mobile, which are available to them on a devices. While he's performing his other task, he can do some other task also. So there are applications which are being tested and tried out where he gets his agriculture updates, he gets his general knowledge questions, he gets his updates on education right on the mobile while he's doing some other work. So these things are happening and definitely they are the drivers for the mobile broadband to come in. Commenting in terms of the video to be a part of this whole game plan, there, there you need to need to have a device which just projects the things in a, in a rural area or in a panchayat area, if most of us are familiar. So what it needs, when you have a mobile, you have a mobile broadband in place, you need to connect a device which can project across. So you have a community kind of learning, and once you have this projection device available, all your e-health applications, all your e-education applications are very well be able to transfer on this. And these devices, don't, don't underestimate, are available globally as of now. In terms of the USO fundings, there is a long, uh, there is a thrust on the, for the broadband part. So far, the USO funds have been made available for the infrastructure as far as the mobility is concerned. But there is, and I am sure most of us are aware of it, that they are reading the USO funds to be made available for the customer premises equipment as well for the broadband penetration. So definitely, the funds which are lying idle will be are being available for this per particular purpose. So that will increase the broadband penetration. My observations. Thanks. Thanks, Sandeep. For a moment, I was confused. I thought Dick was doing the summing up, you know. <laughs> OK, no, no, just light aside. Your name, please? My name is Jimson. Jimson. OK, I'm the president of Information Technology Industry Association of Nigeria. Uh, actually, when we're talking about emerging markets, I've been hearing of uh, India, Asia. But I think these, these are already established market. And the new emerging market is in Africa and Nigeria specifically. Uh, so the 27 billion should come to Nigeria, actually. <laughs> uh, I, I, I recognize that uh, Cisco will be doing a lot of work. There are a lot of academy, Cisco Academy in Nigeria, a lot of network engineers. Uh, well, well, about software, uh, we're talking about services, and the services will, will drive a lot of uh, penetration and demand. So perhaps that is uh, an area we need to look at. Uh, low-cost uh, services, we know about telecom boom in, in Nigeria particularly with mobile technology. So service, I agree with the fact that we need to uh, come up with a broadband on mobile uh, systems. And with that, more people can uh, really have access to it. The intervention measures, direct intervention measures. Uh, our government have some projects like uh, Universal Service Provision Fund, uh, kind of intervening in the rural areas. At the same time, our association, that is just private based, we to have a project called OSPC, that is Old Student Personal Computers. Uh, low cost, uh, Art was talking about low cost PC, low cost solution. We also identified our niche, uh, encouraging old students to remember their alma maters, their primary, secondary schools, and they have, there's a lot of money in private pockets, so get some of this money out. So we kind of come up with a scheme to encourage them to do this. So a lot of uh, states, uh, old students, they've been calling us, come and launch it, come and launch it here. And we also have this, this same scheme. We build the local capacity, the local industry. So it's a kind of ecosystem that we're trying uh, to build. 
So intervention uh, efforts are looking into training for software capacity. Network is very good, very relevant. In fact, Cisco is on a wide radar in Nigeria, commended for their great work. And uh, perhaps other measures to focus on uh, Africa, particularly Nigeria. So uh, perhaps India should do more in Nigeria, not just everything come to India, India. Thank you. Jimson, thank you very much. Um, we're on a learning curve in India ourselves. So when we're done with this, we'll come along. <laughs> Let me just mention a couple. Of, thanks very much for those, those comments. Uh, one of the things that the platform that we've developed, uh, we, we've gone out to other partners, and so we have a number of other companies, uh, Hewlett Packard with regard to operating systems, uh, Adobe with regard to web design capabilities, and they have in fact provided course material that runs on top of the Cisco platforms. And so some of the universities, not all of them, but some of them also provide courses that are based on that HP, so there are software operating systems and there are WebEx or, or uh, excuse me, uh, uh, web-based uh, tools that uh, come from the Adobe product. So, so that we, we do have those capabilities. I'm not sure specific uh, universities in, in Nigeria and which ones have those other programs or not. The other thing I wanted to mention to tap uh, to uh, uh, you know kind of build on the point that you made is. Uh, you know, in, in developing those 10,000, we have uh, about 65 of them with the ITU, uh, about 150 of them with UNDP, a number of them with USAID. Uh, in developing countries and places that wouldn't necessarily have, have had one if it wasn't for the assistance that, uh, they, that these organizations provide. But we did a study with the ITU and UNDP and USAID uh, about a year ago looking at the graduates from those programs as to what they were doing. And one of the things we found unbelievable was that it turned out about 15% of the graduates actually when they graduated started businesses of their own. I mean, just think of schools, uh, colleges in the U.S. or Western Europe. Do you expect that 15% of the graduates are going to go out and start their own business as a consequence? The, the entrepreneurship that we uh, identified in these least developed countries, the opportunities that they saw was just uh, un unbelievable. So one of the things that we're doing with the ITU and with the others is to uh, uh, in, you know, modulate the program slightly so that, in, that we're going to have, in addition to the basic courses that relative to networking, also courses on entrepreneurship and on business skills to recognize that what we have in, in the student body there are a number of people who are really you know, energized to do that and then we've also contributed a uh, million dollars, and we've also uh, partnering with the uh, 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 the Grameen Bank to provide additional funds. So again, we can leverage our, our million may allow them to to lend even more to provide. It's not so much microfinancing, but macro financing uh, sufficient numbers so that. The, the students from these kinds of programs could perhaps identify programs or, or projects and then we provide funding that might be the genesis for, for businesses. So uh, uh, just to build on your, program, your, your, your comments about the, uh, the energy and the desire to, uh, to move in, in Nigeria, uh, we're finding that widespread in the developing world. Thanks, Art. Now before I hand it back to Dick, there are two important announcements I've been asked to make. One of them is that the host country dinner is today at 7.30 p.m. at Rock Heights in Shilpa, Ramam. Shuttle service uh, is available from this venue to the dinner venue from 6.30 p.m. onwards. You are requested to assemble at the front here and there will be buses to take you to the dinner venue. Um, the dress code is informal, so you can let your hair down. And there will be a shuttle service back to the respective hotels from the dinner venue starting from 9.45 p.m. onwards. So we're going to get bus there and we're going to get bus back. And the request is, do not take your own transport, take the buses. Okay, that's a specific request that has been made here. There's one more small announcement and I want to make these announcements before Dick sums up because I'm so afraid you'll get up and rush out, you know. Uh, this is from a gentleman called Mawaki Chango. He's left his IGF backpack uh, with his passport and business cards. His name is Mawaki Chango, along with a book called Network Power. And somebody's picked up his bag and walked off with it. All the bags look the same, right? 
so he says, could you please check your IGF bag? If it is with a passport saying Mawaki Chango and there's a network power book, you return that bag to the lost and found desk behind the uh, registration in the front. And hopefully you'll get an empty bag. <laughs> so please do check your bags. Dick, with that, I hand over to you to sum up. David, thank you very much. Um, uh, let me uh, quickly go over some points that I think have been made in this very interesting uh, workshop. Uh, first of all, of course, we'd like to express our appreciation to Mr. Graham Vickery for his uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, Graham indicated to us that, it, that there is, uh, within the OECD co uh, community, uh, that there is uh, clearly uh, countries are in recession. And this has been for, and that there is every anticipation by economic analysts that this recession will continue for some time. However, uh, there are key growth areas outside the uh, OECD community that represent, uh, uh, that continue to represent uh, significant growth. Um, and that um, uh, whereas 75% currently of uh, uh, the information communications technology is within the OECD ICT market, uh, and t obviously 25% elsewhere, but the growth is in the 25% uh, that is elsewhere. With respe uh, respect to India, India uh, has uh, uh, 250 of the top firms uh, in this area, which is a, um, a, a significant addition. Um, and then as we would ask uh, in this environment, what are policy uh, cri uh, priorities for governments? Uh, Mr. Vickery's uh, analysis of government's responses has indicated that first, uh, that government online uh, is one of the uh, government's top uh, priorities, e-government in other words. Uh, secondly is broadband implementation. Thirdly is ICT R&D. And lastly, IT education. When David asked the, uh, some very penetrating questions, the responses tended to be consistent with the findings of Graham's uh, analysis. So that the first question that was asked is, um, how does uh, business evaluate the opportunities in emer emerging economies? Uh, and what do they look for, that is say businesses look for uh, prior to doing business in these emerging economies? Um, there were, was a consistent answer by the panelists, which is first of all, they look for rule of law, they look for certainty and predictability. They also look for uh, whether or not the population has uh, uh, sufficient training and, uh, and at the same time what opportunities are there to bring training through partnerships. Uh, there is an emphasis on the ability to control one's investment, business investment, through licensing or through some other means. Uh, but it was also emphasized uh, that as businesses look at investment opportunities in the emerging economies, they also understand that they are bringing benefits uh, to those economies, as in the case of broadband, which has many uh, complementary benefits once broadband uh, has been deployed. The second question that uh, David asked is, what trends do the panelists see in uh, IP-based services? And they tended to be uh, four or five uh, key trends. One is that the multinational corporation is seeking a kind of end-to-end -end service on IP-based services uh, that uh, will present consistency and predictability for them. Uh, secondly, uh, we see that uh, next generation networks uh, uh, deployment uh, is, a, um, is one uh, where there's a lot of effort going into, but also with that, uh, is being created a platform for the deployment of IP-based services. Um, and that, again, we find uh, that governments um, are, uh, as they are heavy users of IP-based services, are also encouraging of the deployment uh, of NGN. Uh, secondly, voice over IP. Uh, as we have noted, uh, that tends to be a service that crosses uh, all kind of population sectors, uh, population demographics. Um, and that is an area that uh, is only limited by the regulatory barriers that it faces, but that is clearly a trend. Uh, also, obviously, broadband, again coming back to Graham Victory's findings, 
that the deployment of broadband will not only bring uh, additional IP-based services, but will hasten uh, the deployment of next generation uh, networks. But there needs to be, in these emerging economies in particular, uh, there needs to be a way to in encourage broadband uh, deployment. And there may be a variety of ways of doing that, uh, including uh, looking at the British telecom model of, on the one hand, uh, providing a wholesale service, particularly with respect uh, to connectivity in the, in the last mile uh, to, the, to the residents, uh, while also creating a retail uh, competition. That's one model. Uh, other uh, models uh, certainly are more traditional in terms of universal service uh, funds, uh, but there are, and there should be noted, there are a variety of models for universal so, uh, service funds. But nonetheless, broadband is a key which underlies uh, the deployment of, of the IP-based services. The last question that uh, was raised by David w had to do with uh, internet connectivity. Uh, and uh, he focused um, on India, and he, uh, from his question, would indicate that there seems to be a plateauing um, of uh, broadband deployment in India at some 10 million uh, subscribers, and why is that the case? Uh, the panelists uh, indicated that there are regulatory impediments to the deployment of broadband. Uh, for example, the cost of spectrum uh, limits the deployment of WiMAX or Wi-Fi, which could be an in, a, 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 could in, uh, be an incentive for uh, the uh, use of broadband and its deployment. Um, also, that uh, as India is 65 percent rural, there needs to be ways of bringing uh, broadband to that area that is that is more than simply voice-based. Uh, that is not going to be sufficient. And one of our panelists indicated that uh, video is going to be key in that regard, and in particular in terms of bringing other government services that are video-based, like education uh, and e-health. Um, uh, but it was the consensus of the panel at the end of the day that uh, the IP-based world uh, uh, is dependent upon broadband deployment uh, and that there has to be a, a proper regulatory environment to bring about that deployment. The role of government seems to be key uh, in this regard, not only as an early adopter of technology, but also as the regulator, which can uh, facilitate or can discourage deployment of broadband. There was also the suggestion that uh, necessity may speed the deployment of broadband, and the necessity may be in the form of environmental changes, climate change, which we are all facing on a global basis, may bring about uh, a heightened awareness that we need to bring broadband deployment uh, and, uh, to our communities in order to bring about environmentally uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, kinds of, uh, of, of services that can c manage traffic, for example, or can, that can predict uh, environmental um, crises, whether in terms of weather or other forms. And then lastly, uh, as India, and I will end on the note of India, as India is looking at uh, for a unified communications environment, uh, that uh, may mean that there needs to be a kind of uh, wide uh, or uh, spread uh, evaluation of uh, India's infrastructure and how that infrastructure can be, in its, in its variety, encouraged and a deployment uh, of new uh, infrastructure can be brought about. And at the end of the day, that always brings us back again to government as a catalyst for uh, communications deployment and as ultimately the regulator that can turn the spigot on or can turn it off. With that, Mr. Uh, 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 facilitator and moderator, I conclude the summary of this, of this workshop. Uh, let me say, as I am uh, in the, have the great honor of acting as chair uh, for this very distinguished panel, uh, I would like to first of all thank our moderator, uh, David Apasami, who did a marvelous job in keeping the discussion going and bringing some questions to the panelists, which I know the panelists found um, uh, challenging. Uh, secondly, let me thank our panelists, our distinguished panelists who 
uh, responded uh, so uh, wonderfully to uh, the questions that were being posed, and I think they provided insights for all of us uh, to take away from this subject. And lastly, uh, but most importantly, let me again thank the Federation of Chamber of Commerce of India for making this workshop possible and making it possible for us to join together in this discussion. Thank you all very much.